Have you seen the movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit? If you have, you probably remember the scene where Judge Doom explains his evil plan. Nobody's gonna drive this lousy freeway when they can take the red car for a nickel. Oh, well, they'll drive. They'll have to. You see, I bought the red car so I could dismantle it. Judge Doom's plan to replace the streetcars with freeways wasn't entirely fiction. It's based on a 1974 U.S. Senate report that detailed General Motors' takeover of the Pacific Electric Railroad, the company that ran LA's streetcars at the time. General Motors bought up the streetcar network and replaced them with buses, paving a way for the LA freeway network. Or at least that's the story. But how much of that story is true? What's the real story? Normally I'll believe anything a Christopher Lloyd character tells me. Roads? Where we're going, we don't need roads. But as with most things in planning, the truth is more complicated than that. So let's go back in time to the turn of the last century in Los Angeles. Los Angeles was growing fast. The city's population tripled between 1900 and 1910 and doubled in the decade after. Growth was fueled by oil deposits in the Los Angeles basin. The population spread across the area as workers needed to be near the derricks and refineries. Oil was increasingly needed to fuel the Ford Model T's coming off the assembly line, but cars were still not yet the dominant mode of transportation. At around this time, railroad magnate Henry Huntington had acquired and combined several transit lines in the Los Angeles area into one Pacific Electric Railway Company. He would continue to grow the network through the Los Angeles basin, connecting downtown Los Angeles to growing communities such as Santa Monica and Pasadena. At its peak, the red car network had 1,300 miles of track. It was the largest network in the world. Los Angeles was known throughout the world for its mass transit. Crazy, right? Huntington and the Pacific Electric Railroad didn't wait for the region to grow to provide transit to those new residents. They built tracks right out into the orange groves in between the oil wells on land they owned and built new communities there. The rail lines turned previously low-value land into high-value land. They made a tidy profit selling the lots and homes to the thousands of people migrating to Southern California. This is one of the key points here. Huntington and his investors knew there was more money to be made in real estate than in the transit lines. In many cases, the rail lines lost money, but they made the surrounding lands so valuable that it was worth it for them to build it. This obviously leads to a problem once the land is sold and the value extracted. Now you're operating rail lines at a loss and there's no money to be gained from the real estate. LA was growing and the money was pouring in until ridership began to fall. The Model T I mentioned earlier is really starting to catch on, and by the 1920s and 1930s, Americans were getting behind the wheel in droves. We associate the car with the post-war years in the freeway era, but the truth is that the car caught on much earlier than that, especially here in Los Angeles. There's a certain irony here, as the streetcar helped Los Angeles transition to the car more easily than cities on the East Coast. Los Angeles was a late bloomer, as cities go, and didn't grow substantially prior to the streetcar era. It didn't have that dense, pedestrian-centric core that New York, Philadelphia, and other East Coast cities had. Los Angeles grew large in the era of the streetcar, which counterintuitively made it easy for the city's residents to convert to car use. Streetcar suburbs were the first suburban sprawl, and the low to moderate density neighborhoods were a good fit for cars. People were also turning away from streetcars due to the increasingly poor condition of the streetcars and tracks. Pacific Electric didn't have a strong incentive to maintain the lines after they profited from the real estate. By the 1940s, the tracks were in rough shape. The company was at a crossroads. Many of the lines were losing money and ridership was falling. The cost to repair the tracks were mounting. At the same time, buses had emerged as a viable and affordable replacement. They only required one operator, while Pacific Electric streetcars had two. Buses didn't require track maintenance either. It was in this moment, 1945, that National City Lines, a bus company owned by General Motors and oil and tire companies, purchased the streetcar company and renamed it to Los Angeles Transit Lines. There is no doubt that the National City Lines wanted to convert the streetcar lines into buses. They did the same thing to transit systems around the United States, and were even indicted on counts of conspiring to acquire control of a number of transit companies, forming a transportation monopoly, and conspiring to monopolize sales of buses and supplies to companies owned by National City Lines. With National City Lines owning the Pacific Electric Red Cars, there was no hope for rail transit in Los Angeles but the streetcar was already on the way out. The car had replaced the streetcar as the dominant mode of transportation. There is a chance that if General Motors didn't own the company, a different operator may have been able to salvage the few profitable lines, but Los Angeles was never gonna have 1,300 miles of track again. I know that the Roger Rabbit story is a little more compelling than the story I just told, 
but the truth is that city planning is more nuanced than good versus evil. Transportation, land use, economics, and technology all interact in complex ways to shape our built environment. And nowhere is that more true than here in LA. The good news is that rail transit in LA is making a bit of a comeback, and I don't think GM has any plans to buy it up anytime soon. Unfortunately for Huntington and the Pacific Electric Railroad Company, there is no course they could take on how to successfully manage a transportation company as the world shifts to the automobile. If Huntington had Skillshare, he could have taken a management course on how to change and adapt. There's an entire category of management videos that could have helped him out. But luckily for us, we can take advantage of Skillshare today. Skillshare is an online learning community with over 20,000 classes in design, business, technology, and more. Premium membership gives you unlimited access to high-quality classes on must-know topics so you can improve your skills, unlock new job opportunities, and do the work that you love. Join the millions of people already learning on Skillshare today with a special offer just for you. Get two months of Skillshare for free. To sign up, visit the link in the description and get two months of unlimited access to over 20,000 classes for free. Act now and start learning today.